Hello everyone. Today I would like to look at the game uh, that just took place uh, April 14th, 2017 between Hikaru Nakamura with the white pieces and GM Peter Svidler with the black pieces. And it was a rapid game at the uh, Korsnoi uh, Memorial Tournament. And um, we are interested in the end game, but we're going to briefly run through the opening. So we have an English, which uh, seems to be increasing in popularity these days. And it's not surprising uh, due to the increased amount of analysis on other mainline openings and the uh, desire for GMs to often avoid extensive preparation, and especially in a rapid game. So we are seeing C4 a lot more um, often. G6, very flexible response to C4. Of course, there are many other responses. E5, of course, which is a favorite of this one in Anand. Of course, Knight F6 for those uh, who like to transpose into a uh, certain type of Indian defenses. And this is one of the allures of the English opening is that uh, it is extremely uh, flexible. And if you just want to uh, play chess and rely on your middle game, in end game capability, C4 is a great move. All right. So G6, popular uh, at one time, and also used by none other than uh, Gary Kasparov in his games. And this is another flexible move. As uh, from G6, uh, you can end up in the King's Indian defense. You can end up even in a Dutch defense after say D6 and F5. For example, so flexibility is the key here. C5, all right. G3, Bishop G7, Bishop G2, and now we have this symmetrical English going on. Knight C6, E3, and one of the points behind E3 is to reinforce the D4 uh, move, which attacks black on the dark squares as you can see in the beginning of the game white concentrated on the squares e4 and d5 with the move c4 concentrating on d5 the move knight c3 concentrating on d5 and e4 and then of course bishop g2 concentrating on the same squares through the light square diagonal so once he's accomplished that then he starts working against the dark squares and we see in the symmetrical English, we see that black concentrates his forces on the dark squares. And he leaves the light squares somewhat neglected. So black's plan is analogous to white's plan, except from the opposite uh, side of the board. And what black wants to do is after establishing uh, solid control of the dark squares then he will go and attack the light squares however since white has the first move he's able to strike first and start interfering with blacks um, established control over the dark squares therefore instead of black being able to just immediately switch his attack to the light squares he must take time to defend uh, his uh, fortifications on the dark squares so after e3, Svidler plays e5. Now, of course, this leads to greater weakness on the dark on the light squares for black, and it will be harder later on to, of course, uh, be able to fight for the uh, light squares. Because once you make that pawn advance to e5, then you just bypass any kind of um, fight for the uh, light squares. This is a system uh, in black I'm talking about. This is a system that Botvinnik used to play, known as the Botvinnik system. And um, very, uh, he, he scored some um, nice victories uh, with it, it's black. It takes on um, uh, positional maneuvering nature, as you can see with the pawns uh, clogging up the middle of the board. Knight GE2, same idea. Okay. Knight G7, so the symmetry continues. Castles, castles. 
Knight d5, so Nakamura jumps in. Moves the knight up to the board. D6. And we still see black playing on the dark squares. Right? He has not really addressed the the uh, weakness on the light squares as of yet. Save for this knight. Now, it's important to remember in closed positions that one of the most important things, if not the most important thing, is to find a place to uh, open files uh, for the rooks. Um, it's very difficult to get them in the game when the position is closed. So you must look at your breaks in the position. For white, breaks right here. All right, there's this pawn here on uh, e5. That's a possible break. There's another one. And there's another one. And those are pretty much the places where you want to consider putting your rooks. Either on b1, d1, or f1. For black... Black has this break right here on B5. Okay. And also in this line, you will be considering the advance of the F F pawn. So the rook oftentimes is well uh, placed here. Um, you know, like in the King's Indian defense or Dutch defense. The rook is often well placed on F5. So knight EC3. Nakamura improves the quality of his knights. Spittler plays bishop f5. So now he begins to try to address the situation on the light squares. Interesting is knight takes d5. Swapping a pair of knights. But I'm not sure it makes too big of a difference. It just uh, relieves a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of the um, cramped feeling that uh, black may be experiencing. But bishop f5, nothing wrong with that move. D3. Notice how Nakamura guards his light squares. See, because it's not enough just to bust out of uh, the opening. Right? Controlling squares. But you must keep those squares under control. Because if you spend your energy and time placing your pieces and pawns to control a certain area of the board. And then you lose uh, control without compensation in, say, another sector of the board. You just, you know, arbitrarily just lose control. Then you'll stand worse. Because all your pieces will be uh, out of position, basically. Because if they're not controlling anything, why are they there? So it's very important. So Nakamura plays d3. This is a concession somewhat because earlier perhaps he wanted to play the move d4 and bust open, um, bust up Black's influence in the center. However, Nakamura is content to have this control over the light squares. So Black has his... Um, has some control over the dark squares. White has good control over the light squares. The difference here, and I give I will give the slight nod to White, is that he has a piece on d5 and he has a piece on c3 and his bishop on g2 are all beautifully uh, placed. Okay, and then as for Black, even though he has this pawn on e5, he's not able to put a piece here on uh, d4 or uh, e4 for that matter so this pawn here uh, gives and this pawn here for that matter gives black some kind of authority in the center but it's more of like a defensive authority where he can keep uh, white from occupying d4 but um, it's not doing anything to en enhance his activity in the center for instance his bishop is blocked and um, it's just a stodgy position, right? Tough to overrun, but it's not, um, you know, not just bursting with possibilities offensively for black. Again, looking at the break opportunities is here. This is your major break for black. So oftentimes you will see the move like rook b8 followed by b5 or a6, you know, if it takes uh, preparation. 
here. Queen d7. A3. And now we see with this move A3, it seems like Nakamura has chosen to break here. Remember I said he has his choice. Right? He could choose one or two or three. All three breaks if he wanted to. But just know that it's important to find uh, adequate uh, place to break. Open the position. Bishop H3. So... Fiddler plays in a very primitive uh, sense and decides to just simply trade off the light square bishop. Nakamura continues with his plan, and there it is. Just like magic, he puts the rook right on b1 and wants to break open the uh, b file. And now Spiddler decides to trade. Also interesting to me was F5, which is a move that you normally want to uh, get in there. But he took first. Knight takes D5. C takes D5. Knight E7. So Nakamura creates a bit, a little bit of pawn weakness, but he kind of solidifies his authority in the in the center there. And there's B4. Now, this move is a little, a little interesting because this knight is left kind of unprotected here. But it seems like there's no real way to exploit that. For instance, here, then Naka could just uh, capture the pawn. So he carries on with b4. C takes B4, and now A takes B4. Now, um, if Rook takes B4, then Rook FC8, Rook B3, and then we see Black grabbing some kind of initiative. Now, to me, the tides start turning here after this move because normally you you create this opportunity so you can break open the file uh for the rook so that he can take with the rook you don't want to play this and then not be able to not be able to take with the rook so to me this is a sign that something is going wrong because now the rook is behind this pawn you don't want the rook there you want the rook to be on the open file Okay, so say after knight e7, let's say e4, giving this guy some protection. And let's say, for example, f5. Let's fortify with f3. f4. Just trying to play in like a King's Indian style here. Yeah, I don't know, b4. And let's say he played that with the with the eye on this guy. Bishop D2. And let's say he took, for example. You see, that's how it should look right there. With the rooks on the open file. With pressure. That's that's why it's important in closed positions. You're looking for you're looking for the right break that's gonna allow your rook to have um you know, a good opportunity of having a successful career on the chessboard. You don't want to put your rook on the file and then, then the file doesn't open. Right? Okay? It's just like pursuing a degree in college and then find out after graduation that there is no jobs in that field or the technology that you trained on is now obsolete all right so with the rook you want to make sure the rook has opportunity <clears throat> let's go back to the position 
So after 97, B4, right, good intentions, C takes B4, A takes B4, and now the rook is still facing the same um, dilemma. Meanwhile, on the other side of the board, Spitler plays this move, bishop h6, trying to give his bishop some more scope. A natural move to me is simply rook ac8, putting the rook on the open file. The same rules apply to the black pieces and the white pieces. Alright, no need to get fancy with bishop h6. Anyway, bishop h6. And e4, a good move by Hikaru Nakamura. Bishop takes. And rook takes c1. So now you see, you now based on what I've said, you can see the error in the play, the play right? And in the, in the plays that just took place. You can see what went wrong. And think about it for a couple of minutes, even if you have to pause the video. Just meditate on what I had just said. All right, so let's take assessment of what just happened. So, first of all, from the white side, perspective of the board, I'm going to go back a couple of moves. After A takes B4, the rook on B1 still had to find a home, uh, find a job, so to speak. Right? The rook on B1 doesn't have a future. The only way that rook has a future is if somehow the B-pawn is traded off uh, miraculously. Okay, now fast forward a few moves. Bishop h6, which, which, which was questionable, and e4. So now Nakamura fortifies his pawn on uh, d5, and he attacks the bishop with a bit a piece that's not even developed. So, with that knowledge, what should what should Black do? Black should probably just stick that bishop back. Yes, it's a bad bishop is behind here, but he trades the bishop and helps helps uh white achieve what he wants, which is the which is the open file for this rook. Instead, Nakamura doesn't even have to develop the piece. He just gives him a tempo. Here. I know the position's closed and the temp temp you aren't that important, but What's what's important to me is that he improved Nakamura's position. For what? Why would you do that? Why would you make an exchange and improve your opponent's position? Right? I don't care what your rating is. Okay, Rook F C eight. Queen D two. Okay, immediately immediately taking over the dark, the vacant dark squares. You see, just like that, this rook is feeling good, right? This rook went from being unemployed to having a good job, you know. Start or or you know, forget a job, right? Starting your own business, entrepreneurship is the way to go, right? So this rook went from struggling on B1 and now is you know wearing a suit and tie on C1. Okay, so right here, I give the nod to white. White position is better. Rook c7, so now the battle for the open file continues, right? The double up. F5, remember I was talking about the breaks earlier. I said b4, d4, and f4. So this rook needs a home too, right? So white could choose to try to double up, maybe playing like move like rook c2. Rook F1, that's one plan. The other plan is to use a second break, which he does, F4. Okay, because the battle for the center does not stop. Okay, it's not the battle. That's the thing. A lot of uh, amateurs make the mistake, and they just think the battle for the center is just in the opening. A lot of times, the battle for the center goes way, way, um, uh, goes on after the opening into the middle game. And farther than that, these play. This is move twenty. They're still fighting for the for the center. White is White is taking full control over the light squares. So now he's trying to he's trying to destroy Black's um control over the dark squares. If he can do that, he'll have full control of the the center. 
And when I talk about the center, I'm talking about four squares in the center right here that's uh, highlighted. Not I'm not talking about C4, D, and D5 and the extended center. I'm talking about this four squares right there. Battle still goes on. So Fiddler um, doubles up. Okay, so he did what he had to do. He has his rooks open file. Okay, Nakamura exchanges. So he got rid of one pawn. So now if he can get rid of this pawn, he can establish full control in the center. Okay, and this is good too for white. Nice pass pawn here. What black, excuse me, what white has to keep in mind and what what uh, is a positive for black is these two pass pawns, not pass pawns, these two pawns on the queen side. It's two to one majority, right? Because one of them could easily become a dangerous pass pawn. Okay, so rook c2. So maybe Nakamura is having second thoughts here. So he opened up this file, but now he sees the pressure here and perhaps he wants to make a move like that. Okay, queen d6. Now queen f2. Sees an opportunity and attacks on the f file. And he, Nakamura made a tactical oversight there. Perhaps a move like Rook FC1. All right. With an interesting game still to follow. Now here, just attacking this move. Uh, excuse me, attacking this pawn. And we see the knight is vulnerable here. The idea of Nakamura is, of course... If rook takes c3, then queen takes f7 check. It's just winning. At the king h8, rook takes c3. And of course, the main idea is once this rook is deflected off the back rank, then queen f8. And then what happens after queen f8 check? Only defense is the knight, and then the queen will drop off the board. So he felt tactically justified in doing that. Nakamura is attacking the f7 and a7 pawns, by the way. Svidler finds the move of the game and just blocks this threat right here. He blocks blocks uh, f7. Okay. And he's threatening to go in, into this square, which would be devastating the white. Because it's really difficult to get that knight out of there. And the threat now is to just simply snap the knight off the board. These moves are forced. So E takes F5. And notice, right? Remember I was talking about the fight for the center continuing. Notice how knight F5 still fights for the center. Because now the uh, transaction E takes F5 takes away white's influence over the light squares. You see the battle is still going on for the center. Don't forget that. So now that pawn on e4, which was supporting d5, is gone. This makes d5 weaker. And subsequently, d3 is also weak. Right? When the pawns were like that, the white pawns were like that. Not too shabby. Now they look suspect. Rook takes c3. Rook takes c3. Rook takes c3. Again... Open file, owned by black, and white has this file, okay, but it's not open again. He even forced him to uh, close, the, close the file, but there's a threat on this pawn, and a threat on this pawn, and a threat on this pawn. So all four white pawns, right, from the B file to the F file, all have bounties on their head. Just like just like that in a couple of moves. Amazing, amazing chess here by Svidler. And remember, it's a rapid game. 45 minutes. So, <laughs> Queen F3. So, Nakamura is trying to protect. This is a bad sign. When your queen is put on defensive duty, it's a bad sign. That's an all-hands-on-deck type move. Right? Because the queen is royalty. You don't want to use the queen... In defensive posture. You want to attack with the queen. You want to checkmate with the queen. But now the queen is a force to go on defense. G takes f5 from Spiddler. Queen takes f5. And the 
Queen goes back on attack. Queen takes d5 check from Svitler, which attacks and defends, which is, you know, the kind of moves you want to do. And now I want you to look at the board with me. Look at the center of the board after queen takes d5 check, right? And tell me who owns the majority of the center now, right? You have the queen here occupying and controlling. We have the e pawn, right? Controlling d4, all right? And white just has the queen and the d pawn influencing e5. All right. So when it comes to control of those four squares in the center, black has a three to one league there. Black is controlling D4, E5, and uh, the uh, D, D, D5, E5, and the D4 square. And white is barely hanging on to uh, E4. And remember what I said. When you start out the game with a certain strategy to control a certain group of squares and lose that, uh, you know, lose that battle, you often will stand worse because you need you need some kind of um, uh, transition to another advantage. For instance, you might be controlling the center, you lose that, and then now you're you know got a raging attack against the king or something like that. That's different because you have some kind of uh, compensation. You know, it's just like losing material. You lose material but have an attack against the king or, you know, you know, some type of uh, uh, other factors that uh, can balance your deficit, then you're okay. But if you have no compensation, you're just down a pawn or you're just down a knight or you're just down uh, positionally. You know, you just lose squares position. Your, your opponent just has more space. And no, you know, you have nothing to show for it. You're worse. Here, Nakamura is worse. Right? King H3. So now the king is on the run. Okay, now there's a bounty out for the king. The king is wanted in three states. Alright? King is running now. Rook C6. Okay, now, all right, going to checkmate the king. G4, providing an escape square for the king. Rook D6, very powerful move. And I should have mentioned that besides the, the checkmate theme, is the theme just to come here and attack this pawn. Okay, so Fiddler perceives winning endgame here, because why give Nakamura chances? Remember these two, this two to one I mentioned earlier. G5 check. Naka is trying to counterattack. Check, check, and this endgame is quite instructive here. First thing you always want to think and when you, before making any move in chess, you want to have an objective. Okay, objective, plan, right? You know, objective, plan, and then uh, tactics, how to get to, how to uh, fulfill the plan, right? So here in this position, my objective would be to create a pass point here. All right. So that would be my ultimate objective, to, to use these uh, far side queen pawns and create a pass pawn, right? That's my number one thing. Second, I would be thinking is I realize that black, excuse me, that white has some uh, weak pawns here. So what I want to do in any rook end game is you want to activate your rook and keep it active, 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 active. That's that's always how you want your rooks. You do not want your rook in the end game to be def uh, defensive. It's too strong, too strong to be guarding pawns. All right. So to implement the, the now, it's time to go. So those are your main goals: keep an active rook, use the two to one uh, majority on the queen side to 
to create a pass pawn and of course activity entails attacking you want to attack those weak pawns I see two weak pawns here right the pawns next to the king are kind of difficult the king's guarding them right but you can attack the pawn on b4 and d4 and the one that's most vulnerable is on b4 so though that would be my plan my plan would be to attack the b4 pawn first okay and to force white's rook into a defensive role right and once i do that i get my rook in the most active position which when i look at the the position i would like my rook to be you know and i'm speaking from the black uh position i would like my rook ultimately to be on d4 why because if you have your rook here on d4 you attack this pawn and that pawn at the same time you force this pawn this rook excuse me to be a defender when that happens then you can march the king into the position okay so there's goals plans and then now the tactical aspect is just calculating okay what if i play rook a6 um he's attacking this pawn and that's when you get into the, the um the tactical aspect now one more thing you see this pawn is being attacked now we already know we want our rooks active so therefore don't be foolish and think this move right here is a good move. I mean, you could you could play that, but it's against the principles. I mean, how is your rook going to get out now? So, yeah, you protected the pawn, but it's like, dun, dun, dun. like you know, it's not really in the spirit of the, of the game. Like I say, you probably could put it in the engine or something and, you know, make it work. But that's not the, you know, those aren't, aren't the type of moves that you want to play. You know, you play this move. Spiller says, go ahead, take the pawn. Okay, because I want my rook to be active. Nakamura goes right into passivity. He defends. Because he understands that, hey, if I take this pawn, how am I going to stop these? He, he sees he can't stop them. Okay? So this is part of the, the part of the, um, Objective already being achieved. You got the active rook, passive rook. Now, now f6 is played. Okay, now f6 is played. Notice the rook is active. The rook isn't stuck back here. So he got what he want. He got the active rook and still maintain the pawn. Okay, now it's time for the next phase. H4. See, active rook again, attacking this pawn. Passive rook. Okay, so Nakamura is like pretty close to being lost. Look at that. Rook in the ideal spot. Okay, idea is to undermine the e5 pawn. Right, would you take? Of course not. You want him to take, and then you then you bring your king forward. So b5. It's very hard for uh, Nakamura to do anything at this point. Again, attack with the rook. Takes, g takes f6. King takes f6. Notice, king protecting the pawn. Rook being real aggressive. Now there's no way to um, protect it. Check. That's like a spite check. King g7. Rook f2. Rook takes b5. You see how easy Spittler made it look? Now he starts attacking. And Spittler starts pushing. King g4. King comes back to block out the other king. Again, defensive duty. Trying to protect this pawn and stop the events. King slides over, h5, king f6, the white king cannot enter, rook a1 is played, check, king has to back up, and now the pawn is um, escorted by the rook, check, again, you see how the positions just falling apart, and Nakamura here, uh, you know, threw in the towel. All right. 
I hope you learned a lot from that game. It's very instructive. The rapping games are good because they get over pretty quick. And uh, there's, you know, it's mistakes. And the more mistakes, you know, the more, um, you know, things you can learn, you know, from the games. Because in the longer games, the grandmasters don't make, you know, many errors. But in this game, you saw the battle for the center. You saw uh, Svidler wind up controlling the center where he had three, you know, three to one a square advantage in the center. You know, he finally broke down White's plan. You know, White started, you know, dominating the light squares. Black took over the dark squares. And then they fought to try to take over uh, the, you know, each other's squares, so to speak. You know, White then tried to transition his game and fight for the dark squares. Black transitioned his game fight for the light squares. And Svidler was the one who came out winning. White lost his advantage. Um... We also learned about the open files, where to put the rooks, especially in closed games. See, in an open game, it's easy to find because it's open files. Everybody knows rooks should be on open files. In a closed game, it's more difficult to find places for the rooks because you're trying to figure out which files would be open, which ones would not be. Because you don't want to put the rooks somewhere and then the file doesn't get open, right? So you're playing uh, like a high-level kind of guessing game there you're trying to wait and wait till it's clear and we learned about breaks pawn breaks and uh we saw we saw error by nakamura right with uh that b pawn and then he took with the took with the a pawn and his rook was still behind you know still on the closed file but then Svidler helped him out by playing bishop h6 right and after e4 bishop takes c1 um there was an um uh, clear advantage for Nakamura, right? He, he just, uh, Svidler went through all those bishop moves to trade off an undeveloped piece. <clears throat> Nakamura then moved his rook to c1, and uh, it looked like everything was good. But then, you know, he made a couple of, you know, seemingly good moves when he moved his pieces to the f-file, and then he just uh, was hit by that tactical blow knight to f5. And that just destroyed, that's destroyed his center. And that's another thing we learned, that the center is not just to be fought for in the opening, but the battle for the center continues on, you know, sometime late into the middle game. So we saw the fight for the center, you know, uh, past move 20. You know, and only, you know, near the end when uh, Spitler started creating threats against the king directly that we saw the abandonment of the direct, you know, fight in the center. Then we saw this instructive endgame, and we learned that, and saw, demonstrated by Svidler, the power of the active rook against Nakamura's uh, passive rook. And then we saw, you know, I hope I gave a good example of, again, having a, a goal, right? Then having a plan, and then you, uh, then you figure out the tactics, okay? The goal, plan, and tactics. So first you want to have a goal or overall objective. Like, what am I doing in this position? What should I be doing? Yeah, I want to push those queen side pawns. Okay, I want to activate my rook. That's what I should be doing. I want to bring my king to the center. Those are your, like, general goals. Then the plan is, hmm, how should I do it? Okay, well, I'm going to attack that weak pawn on b4. You know, I'm going to, then I'm going to move my king up the board. I'm going to shield his king from getting in. Right on the king side. Okay, that's your general plan. And then the third stage is tactics. Make sure that when you move that rook, there's not something, you know, there's not a tactic. There's not a, a bolt out of the blue that refutes. And once you clear those things, and then you go on with it. But um, I think one of the great chess players said, like Tarta uh, Cower or somebody like that, that it's better, or Frank Marshall, I think, I can't remember, that it's better to have a bad plan Matter of fact, it was Frank Marshall. It's better to have a bad plan than no plan at all. Please like and subscribe. I'll see you all on the next video.